on behalf of the faculty and staff of the Department of Statistics and Analytical Sciences, I'd like to introduce um, our big data lecture series sponsored by Equifax. So this is actually our fourth event, um, and we're just um, thrilled to actually have somebody from Equifax actually speaking today. Um, so up to this point, we've, uh, we've just been um, blessed with um, the great sponsorship from Equifax, and today we actually have speakers from Equifax, so we're looking forward to a good conversation. So for those of you that haven't been present at previous lectures as part of this series, the Big Data Lecture Series is intended to bring together faculty and students from mathematics and computer science and statistics and sort of all areas of data science to come together to talk about sort of uh, the latest um, trends and some of the bigger issues that, the, that this very nascent discipline is experiencing uh, in terms of challenges uh, in this space. And uh, today we have Mike McBurnett from Equifax and Matt Turner from Equifax, both of whom are alumni of Kennesaw State. Um, and so we're, we're particularly honored to have them here today. And they're going to be talking about some of the um, some of the advances that Equifax has been um, really spearheading in data science, specifically as it relates to um, risk, and um, I think it's specifically consumer risk, mm -hmm. right? Or is it also commercial? This is applicable there, but we build this around consumer. Around consumer. Right. Um, so great. And uh, Equifax was really sort of a leader in data science long before we even knew this term data science. They were sort of data scientists before data science was cool. Uh, and so they've, they've truly been a leader in this space for a long time. So we're really thankful and honored to have Equifax with us today. Um, so please feel free, I think, to ask questions Anytime. throughout the conversation. Yep. And uh, again, thank you to Equifax. And I'll turn it over to Mike McBurnett. Thanks. So thank you for coming. So uh, we appreciate this opportunity. We have, Matt and I, invented this neural network process that we refer to as neurodecision. It is trademarked now so that we can use TM there. And we gave this presentation to every regulator you could imagine in Washington, D.C. last year to try to get this. We tried to get regulatory approval. Of course, they won't actually say yes, but they didn't say no either. And so we took that as it is acceptable. But the point of doing this was to find a way to use machine learning methods because logistic regression, which has been in place since the 70s when the Fair Credit Reporting Act was passed, it was actually written into law October 26, 1970 by President Nixon at the time. It had been written around logistic regression. And logistic regression in that context is very simple, but we have both regulatory and business constraints around how we build our models. So as a statistician, a person who's building a model, you're going to know that if you leave things out, you end up with biased coefficients in your models. And regulation omits, causes you to have to omit variables from your models. But everybody has the same playing field out there in the industry. So we all have the same problems. But the industry was asking us, how do we bring machine learning up against this problem of assessing individual risk? And no one had been able, to our knowledge, uh, to sort out this problem. And so what we did was we sat down and we began to study these models in some very particular instances. And then Matt is the one who came up with the, the proof that this would work for in all instances. And so that is how we developed our, our preliminary patent filing, which we now have put out as a PCT in the international patent filing to try to protect this from our competitors because our main job in life is to put FICO out of business. <laughs> so that's kind of the backstory, and the way that Matt and I give this presentation is we go back and forth. So I do the introduction, he'll take over, and we will definitely go back and forth. Some of the slides we share, as you said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. We've given this a version of this. This is the 30-minute version. We have 20, 30, one hour, and we've given these 20 times now, something like that. So ask questions at any time. So the agenda for today, we're going to set up the problem, talk about what are the existing scoring regulations? Why is this problem not purely an academic problem? Um, 
in case for neural nets, you're all in data science, so you know that how powerful machine learning is. So this is not an argument I need to make to you, but it's certainly one we had to make in in the industry. Um, what we've experienced when we're out talking with customers, as well as internal electrical facts, every time we build models, we test machine learning techniques on the back end just to see what kind of lift we're leaving on the table. And you're always leaving lift on the table, and you, you're always thinking to yourself, wow, I'd really like to use these models in production. I'd really like to use them for my job, but of course nobody knows the way to bring these things into compliance with, with regulations. So talking with our customers, they know that there is performance left on the table by just using logistic regression, not using some of the more advanced techniques. And then we'll look at just what we call an unconstrained neural network. This is the standard neural network you would build in R, SAS, whatever your language of choice is. Some of the challenges that come with this from a business perspective. <clears throat> and then we'll lay out to you how we solve this problem with neuro decision technology, the steps we took to build regulatory compliant um, neural network models. All right, so what are the regulations that we have to conform to so we have a bunch of lawyers, as you might guess, that work for our company, and we always are asking permission, can we do this, and their answer usually is no, unless you can get people like our chief compliance officer on your side, which is the route that we took. And you have to lay out for them, this is the argument that uh, is how we are complying with the regulations that are out there. So. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Dodd-Frank regulations that were written that were absorbed by CFPB, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act all point to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act Regulation B, the requirement that notice for adverse action has to be given, and how do you disclose credit scores? So what is adverse action is the first question. If you apply for credit, from a credit, what's called a credit granting organization, a credit card company, somebody that's going to make you an auto loan, a mortgage, or anything like that, and you ask for terms and they say no, that's adverse action. So you can actually go to a bank and say, I'd like to borrow $10,000 for a year and I want to give you back 2%. If they say no, that's adverse action. And I did that as, as kind of a test because I, I wanted some money in my pocket to go negotiate for an automobile. I literally wanted to borrow the money for 12 months and said, here's what I will pay you. And when they said no, I said, we were in the middle of this process. And I said, that's adverse action. You have to give me a letter that says, why did you deny me? What was the model that you used? So when you have a, a credit scoring system, so there are only two ways to evaluate whether or not to give you credit. One of them is judgmental. And everybody steers away from that because it leads to prejudice and things like this that are undocumented and indefensible. And the others are models, credit scoring systems. So when someone says, what's your FICO score? That's based on a model. If someone says, what's your Equifax risk score? It's based on a model. We have an inventory of over 1,200 risk models in our library. And FICO has a number, TransUnion has theirs, and so on. So a credit scoring system must be empirically derived, demonstrably, and statistically sound credit system. In other words, you know, it's got to conform to standard model building techniques. It's got to meet, meet a certain number of requirements that are written here, the four reasons that are associated with adverse action, and there are various ways to calculate those that we'll get to. The description has to be extracted from our current list of adverse action codes. So when we supplied you guys a set of attributes, every one of those attributes has basically two adverse action codes, the default value and then the value that is selected if it is the main reason that your score dropped. The credit modeling system can only be based on the attributes considered by the credit scoring system, so that el eliminates judgmental rationales behind how you got your score. So if you have a model, it's an equation, generates a score, the attributes contribute to that score, and only those attributes can be considered for adverse action. And the method for selecting adverse action codes has to be similar to the methods that are in the written regulations, which there are two described and we, we tend not to use those. We use a system called points below maximum, which says here's the maximum score you could get, 
the points that you lost for each attribute in the model are, you know, X1 through however many there are. We rank order those and you get returned the top four. And everybody could have a different set. So a credit score is a numerical value or categorization derived from the modeling system. And we have to return four. And the, and the key point here is that the key factors have to come from the model. So you can't, what this means, what this meant to us when we were doing this, because we had a customer, it was a regional bank, that said, hey, we want machine learning, but we're not going to take it until the regulators sign off on it. So when you look at the regulations and it says the key factors have to come out of the model, that means you can't use an auxiliary model to generate those factors, which is what we were aware other people were doing. You could have a neural network that generates the score, plug the same attributes into a logistic regression equation, generate your adverse action codes from the logistic regression equation. That is not from the model that generated your score. So we latched on to the word the. And every time we talked to the regulators, we brought this up. So we have solved the problem of how to generate the adverse action codes from the neural network. All right, so the way we were able to take this to our legal people, our compliance people, we basically went through and laid out, here's the steps that one does for logistic regression. Here's a parallel, slightly more complicated step that we're doing for neural networks. And because we could put these side by side at each step, it was easy for them to approve it because, of course, logistic regression, that's the industry standard already approved. So what I want to do is review real quick how do we return reason codes from logistic regression? So our standard logistic regression model, right, block odds equals x data. And of course, you can put this on a probability scale by taking the logistic transformation. What I want to start with is this last line down here, and then work my way backwards. So we've got a model. It's got n inputs to the model. And what we're going to do, all of these that have a superscript M on it, this is going to be the location of the max. Okay? And logistic regression, this is very easy to determine. Because it's fitting a hyperplane here, we know where the maxes are. You just go to one of the endpoints. If your beta is positive, you're maximized at the right endpoint. If your beta is negative, you're maximized at the left endpoint of that attribute domain. All of our attributes have a fixed, closed form interval domain here. So let's just let um, all of these superscript PMs be the location that maximizes my score. What I'm going to do is compute the score I could have gotten. Okay, so that's beta i times x of i superscript PM, and then subtract from that the score I actually got. That's beta i minus my x i. What was my actual input? This is the score I'm giving up on this input. We call them attributes at Equifax. I use that term. Predictor. Um, variable, attribute, whatever you want to call it. So I'm just looking at how many points did I lose for this attribute, and I do these one attribute at a time. I rank order these, putting them in the order, and I pick the top four. That's what gets returned with my credit score. My credit score is a 700. Here's the top four reasons why it wasn't an 850, or whatever the max score could be. Okay? But what I want to do is work backwards from this, because this is going to give us some insights into what we can do for neural networks. So what we can observe here is that, really, um, all of the other inputs are in play here. I'm just holding them at a constant value, OK? So what is this value here? So this is the global maximum of this score. This is the GPS coordinates to the top of the mountain is what all of these superscript M's are. And then, of course, we're evaluating my score at those coordinates, so that's the max scores. The global max is not changing. So what I'm doing here is I'm standing at the top of the mountain, and I'm telling a customer, now you can walk down the mountain, but you can only go one dimension at a time. I'm going to hold all of the other inputs constant, and I'm just going to change the I input and see how far you fall. For logistic regression, of course, this cleans up quite nicely. If I'm working on the log odds scale, um, holding all of these constant except for one, they all cancel out. 
What we want to do though is focus on this formula because it's this type of thing that I can apply to any type of machine learning algorithm that takes input and produces a score as an output, right? We can, we can look at these types of um, quantities here for generating reason codes as long as I construct my model where in such a way that these quantities are able to be computed and they make logical sense when I do that. Okay. Next slide. All right. So let's make the case. So we don't really divide this slide up. I'll talk about this part. So the first generation of risk scores is logistic regression. You have a, a single connection between every input variable and what it is that you're trying to predict, risk, the probability that somebody is going to go bad or default on a loan, it's typically what we're, what we're predicting. There's only one way to get from here to here. And so that leads to that nice simple or that simplification that was on the previous slide. We have a second way of doing this where you can take two logistic regression models and fuse them. So in this case, this is actually a Y. And this could be a set of data from the credit file, set of what we call our ADA attributes. And this might be alternative data. So we've got another data set that we call the NCTUE Plus database, the National Communications Telephony Utility Exchange, which is a contributor file of the transaction behavior of utility customers. So this data is different from this. But what we would have is two logistic regressions. We would fuse them together where the Y hats over here would be reweighted and we're still predicting bad. Okay? This is a partially connected neural network. That's what this is. Then you've got a fully connected neural network, which is where we are now. So in this case, you've got inputs, which could be this entire set or a subset, where in the hidden layer, which over here is not truly hidden because we know what it is, but there are many ways to get from an input to what it is that we're trying to predict. And what we have to do is take into account, see over here, a single coefficient is associating the relationship between X and Y. Over here, there are going to be many coefficients that associate the relationship between X and what it is that we're trying to predict. And there's actually two sets of them. What we were looking at a minute ago was the partial derivative. That's what the coefficients are. And what we need is the partial derivative for this in order to put this side by side and have that representation. So what we have is two examples, um, one on a custom portfolio where we tested for a customer and one on things that are actually in production that we're selling at Equifax. So I'll start with this custom portfolio. So this was a customer that came in and said, here's the model I use today. That's what we see at 0%. And then they said, what can you do for me? Um, if we rebuild their models and add in our variables, if I just build you a traditional logistic regression scorecard, where can I get to? And then if I apply these neural net methods that are regulatory compliant, where can I get to? And these are um, types of graphs that are, are popular in the industry where we're looking at the tails of distribution, especially rank order, everybody stand in line, and then, you know, as I go in buckets of let's say 5%, how many of the bads, and we call it bad captures, how many bads am I, am I capturing? And that's what we're looking at here in the lowest 5%, which this industry was like a wireless, I believe. The lowest 5% is really what they care about because in this industry, the lowest 5% get assessed a $750 deposit to get a cell phone. If they say, give me $750 to give you this cell phone, most people turn around and walk out the door. 90 plus percent of those customers. So by assessing a deposit, you're almost losing that customer. So at the bottom end is where they truly care about um, making sure the people at the bottom end truly should be at the bottom. Okay? So what we're seeing here is if we did a model rebuild, you know, we could get, let's say, 14% lift here. But if we were using these neural networks, we could get up to 18% lift. This, for this customer, in this bottom 5%, this would have been over a million customers. So that's a lot of lift, a lot of meaningful lift for them. Over here, these are two of our generic products broken out by various segments. 
Um, AC, Advanced Communications, this is um, something in the communications industry for wireless um, subscription TV type accounts. And then AE, Advanced Energy, this is for um, utilities, natural gas providers, things like this. When do they um, assess the deposit? These are broken out by various segments on the file. And what we're measuring here is, is KS, Komogorov, Smarov statistic. Um, you know, similar to Gini, it's just measuring the max separation between your good and bad distribution here. Um, so what you can see, what we want to point out here in this graph is that your lift, this is lift over logistic regression, your lift can basically be zero. In which case, you probably would not want to do a neural net. Why go through the added complexity? Just do a logistic regression. All the way up to I'm seeing 7% lift, which is extremely meaningful lift. It's, it's rare to get this type of lift in the industry today because attributes have become so rigorous and diverse, and logistic regression really has been squeezed for all it can be squeezed. So to get incremental gains is hard to get 7% lift, is quite meaningful. In this. So something else to point out, I don't know if you guys emphasize this when you're like using our data or t teaching these classes, but we carve up our data sets, right? We segment by, we can segment in different ways. You can segment on a score, or in this case, you can segment by the amount of data that people have in the file. So if you look at the left, it says low credit, and then AC high credit, and then if you look at the thin file, you see the less data there is at one level, the less <coughs> lift you're going to get. There's just not enough information to, to flow through this model or any model. So yeah. something to think about is the segmentation problem. Yeah. Thin, thick, standard industry type designation. Thin meaning you just have a few traits on your file. Thick meaning you have a wealth of information, so it's easier to predict on those. Clean, dirty, this is, have you been, whatever we're measuring is bad, delinquent. Have you, have you been delinquent in the past, right? Of course, those segments automatically have an elevated bad rate. You want to take this one? Um, I can. Okay. I think we're getting out of order, but. <laughs> we always do. So just to show um, what a single hidden layer neural network is that we're considering, everything we're doing can actually be applied to any number of layers. For sake of presentation, we only show a single layer just to simplify things. So here's a typical, what's called a, a feed-forward, um, fully connected neural network here. And we have our input layer, x1 through xn. We have a single hidden layer, and all this hidden layer has got M nodes, and then each of those nodes feed our final output, what it is I'm trying to predict, the probability of bad, for example. And then each of these things has a parameter along with what's called biases. These are just intercepts in these connections. You can apply any type of um, what's called an activation function at these. Our only requirement to make what we're about to show you work is that that activation function be differentiable everywhere. So some of the activation functions have sharp corners, right? Those wouldn't necessarily work here, but any other sigmoid function would work. Um, here, what we're doing is we're using the logistic transformation. We're using this as our activation function. If you're working in SAS, they have things like uh, SAS or R. They have hyperbolic tangent, arc tangent, um, a couple that go by people's names. Um, I forget what's all out there. And any, any of that would work, but for the sake of this, what we're going to have is the logistic activation functions. So the notation we're using, beta sub ij, this maps your i input to your j hidden node, and then delta j maps your j node to your final output. You take a linear combination of your inputs at each node, and then apply the logistic transformation, and then once you get all of those done, those then feed your final model, which is a linear combination of the hidden nodes, and take the logistic transformation of that. So we're taking logistics of logistics in these.
All right, so what, what challenges do we have? So this is where we set this up side by side. If you, if you have a logistic regression model and you look at the coefficient, that coefficient applies to everybody exactly the same way. It's constant. The, you can't say that with an unconstrained neural net because the, the combination of ways to get from the input through all the hidden layers to the output layer is not the same for every person. So it is non-constant change. It may be not constant. So this is the formula for the partial derivative of that neural network that we put up there. And this is what allows us to evaluate, do we have a model that is consistent with regulation and with our business rules? In our case, we require that all of the attributes be monotonic. That means, it'll, it will come back to this again, but that means that the, the maximum is either at the left or the right endpoint of the attribute. And we evaluate this the very first thing we do. We set up a modeling exercise. You have a goal. You're going to start by doing EDA. In fact, we're going to go over that in a minute. I don't, I don't want to belabor that. But we have this set of, uh, of criteria that we're going to go through. Uh, here, if you have a positive change, it's always going to produce score increase or score decrease for every single consumer. It may produce score increases or for some consumers, but decreases for others. If the attribute, if its relationship looks like it has a little hook at the end, logistic regression is not going to find that hook. The neural network can. And the maximum partial score is equal for every consumer, and the maximum location is the same for everybody. The GPS coordinates for the maximum are the same. And here, it varies by consumer, and the location can vary. So again, if you have this little crook, the maximum could be somewhere in the interior, and that is a problem for generating reason codes. I'll hang on here just a minute. Take a look at, at this formula and what is, what is represented here. If you look at these coefficients, beta ij times delta j, this is how do I go from the i input to my final output via the jth node. So I'm looking at the product of the weights along each path. And I'm summing these up and multiplying by this strictly positive term, okay? And in fact, not just positive, but this is something that's easy to show is bounded between zero and one fourth. So it's kind of like an importance of, of this path, depending on where you're at on the scoring surface, okay? So, you know, the first thing I would point out is if I'm looking for a positive trend and all of these products were positive, we would be done. We would be guaranteed to have monotonicity, right? Or if I'm looking for a negative trend and these products were all negative, they would be done. Um, hopefully this is something we can speak about uh, with some of the faculty afterwards. There is actually in our library that attempts to build models where the weights are all positive or all negative, but we haven't been able to get it to work past a small academic solution. We try to scale up to bigger problems than and it fails there. What does it fail? What does it fail when you scale it? Um, well, I'm only able to get about three variables into the model, and then after that, it starts um, being unable to compute the weights. Yeah. With about 4,000. Yeah. Because of the dissemination over the products. So probably, you probably have to have a massive computer than a brand. To that, so that shouldn't be a problem for us. We have this thing called Cambrian. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's a big Hadoop file system. With many processors and yeah. terabytes of memory. Yeah. And but still, it still has that computational issue and wouldn't be very well. Well, we're doing it R, so R in and of itself has computational issues no matter how big your system is. But we're, the, <clears throat> the test mats run have been with about 4,000 records. Yeah, 4,000 records by three variables, yeah. which for what we do is nowhere close to what a, what a model should be. Yeah. We have, our, our database has 320 million consumers in it with 10 years of transaction history on about 40,000 variables. But any, any computer science faculty that wants to hear more about this problem, I'll be happy to um, go into more details about it. Yep. Afterwards, maybe you guys will have a spark of inspiration. All right. All right, well, 
So here's the modeling process. The first three steps for anybody who's ever built a model, these are going to be common. You're going to be define your problem, you get a set of candidate predictors. We have, for most risk models, people will start with 535 attributes we call the ADAs, the Advanced Decisioning Attributes. Those are all approved by our compliance and there's nothing in there. You know, if you think about the history of, re of regulation, what it has done is it put more and more constraints on the kind of data that you can actually bring, bring to bear on these problems. We have attributes that still live in our system from the, the early 90s. We don't use them, okay? But uh, because they're out of compliance, because what happens is regulations get passed, people go, okay, we need to take another look at our data, we create another set, okay? And so there have been, over the course of time, you know, we started, Equifax began this computerization of the, the storage of data and analytical problem in the 60s. So we have over 50 years of experience doing this, of moving this forward. So we're working on the ADA attributes. They're all regulatory compliant. And the first thing you do is you look at what it is you're trying to explain and what's the relationship between every single attribute that you can bring to bear on the problem. And so we look at that and we want to see monotonic relationships. If you have some quadratic relationship where the maximum is in the interior of the endpoints, you're going to have a problem, except in a single case that Matt invented, uh, explaining this. Okay? So we look at that relationship, compute the good-bad odds ratio, and quantify its predictive strength and the trend. And then we apply variable treatment. So we're going to use part of the ladder of powers. We'll have uh, square, square root, inverse, and so on. We also compute presence or absence of the attribute for people, dummy variables. And so we have, we start with the straight attributes and we end up with six versions. So we have about 3,000 variables that we bring to bear on this problem. And then we want to make sure that that rela relationship is monotonic at the bivariate level. And then when we build our multivariate model, every attribute in that multivariate model has to agree with the observed EDA. And so that is a constraint on us building these models. And one of the constraints is multicollinearity. When you throw dozens of variables into a problem and many of them are derived from the same source variables, they are going to be related to one another and the consequence of that can be wrong signs. That's, as Matt will, will probably talk about this in detail later, that doesn't harm the predictive power of the model, but it doesn't agree with our business requirement. So we have to get rid of those, we have to do something to, to make that agreement occur. So then we fit this single hidden layer artificial neural network. We put using industry and scientifically accepted standards in there because that's straight out of the regulations. And we apply what we call the coefficient method, which analyzes that partial derivative. Now, if all the signs are positive and the EDA is positive, you're done. But that's almost always not the case. Or the opposite could be true. If all the, all the signs are negative, the relationships are all negative, and you observe this sum to be negative, that you're done. But the fact that you get to evaluate this over all of the ways that you can move from X to Y through the hidden layer allows some of these to be positive or negative, and you still can use that model. It's the sum. This is always positive. So the, the evaluation is driven by this product. And, the, and their sum. And the other thing is that this will, is guaranteed to uh, terminate because if you collapse this down to a single node, then is that sign in agreement with the EDA? Then you're done. So a single hidden layer neural network, which is a logistic of the logistic, will have better predictive power than a single logistic equation and as long as those those two, the two signs are either positive or negative as required, then, it's, then the process terminates. There's something else important to point out with, with step five. Um, if you build a logistic regression, you know it's monotonic on your entire theoretical domain, that domain being the Cartesian product of all your endpoints. For this neural network, um, if I just let the weights be of mixed signs, some of them positive, some of them negative, what I'm doing is I'm only evaluating this derivative. I'm only evaluating it on my observed scoring domain. So it's important that I sample correctly, have a large sample, et cetera. 
But what may happen, as with any extrapolation problem, just because something is well behaved here, what we don't want to have happen is a consumer come in that actually lives over here. And my model's never seen somebody that lives this far out. And I extrapolate and, you know, that model's going wider. So what we would like to see happen is all of these products be positive. And then I know that this thing is increasing on my entire Cartesian product. Currently, again, we can't get those algorithms to work. The only place to know it's implemented is R. So what we're um, doing instead is we're just evaluating this. Um, we're evaluating this on our observed scoring domain, making sure it's monotonic on that scoring domain. Just take a large sample and a large out of time sample, you know, millions of people, evaluating it there, making sure my model behaves correctly here. Our ultimate goal is to make sure it's monotonic on the entire domain so we don't have any risk of extrapolation problems. So one of the ways we, we keep that wild behavior from happening is we cap and floor our data. And so then, and you know, there is another way to, what is it, put the convex hole around the, the whole yeah. set, and then you can map people uniquely. The same people with the same attributes would be mapped uniquely to the same point. So everyone, that way everyone is treated the same, gets the same score, which the regulators uh, are going to the, require. The theoretical solution is if you have a domain, form the convex hull of that domain. Why convex? Because then you can uniquely map anybody outside of that domain. You can uniquely map them to the boundary. Right? I wouldn't want something where this person gets mapped here and the next person's at the same spot and gets mapped here. They get different scores. Computing convex holes is a challenge, right? With it's a curse of dimensionality type problem. So. So what we're doing is we're putting on constraints. The constraint being we need monotonicity to generate reason codes. And we need that monotonicity to be logical, to agree with the data, and be something that can be explained to our customers, something that can be interpreted by our customer. And that's really the key to using these neural networks and this regulated, and this regulated market. So here's the steps you would do for a logistic regression in the parallel step. On logistic regression, you build your model, the very first thing you do is you check your signs, okay? Are they positive that I expect them to be positive? Are they negative that I expect them to be negative? If you have multicollinearity in your model, you're probably gonna get some wrong signs, and you pull some variables out and you reiterate, okay? We're doing the same thing here for these neural nets, it's just checking the sign is not as simple as What's the parameter? Instead, we have to evaluate the partial derivative across my entire observed scoring domain. And then we'll compute some order statistics on that. And you know, we'll say that the sign is correct for 100% of the people, or it's correct for 95% of the people. If it's only correct for 30% of the people, that's when I start having to discard this variable or dramatically change what I've done to this variable and the treatment of it. The logistic regression, right, positive coefficient score increase, negative coefficient score decrease. So now if we evaluate these partial derivatives, they're positive everywhere, that leads to, to score increases. <clears throat> you check the signs you're observing here, and you visually compare these to the raw data, this EDA, these weight of evidence graphs that, that you're producing. <clears throat> and then we have certain levers we can pull. For logistic regression, what can you do? You can transform a variable. You can bend a variable, extremely powerful technique for squeezing information out of attributes. Or you can, you know, a lot of times you have to just discard attributes, bring new attributes in, whatever the case may be. We have all of that available to us for neural nets as well, but I also get to control the neural net architecture. Um, this is something our intern here is working on this year. What's the best architecture? To my knowledge, nobody solved it yet. So we're looking at different things that are out there in academics and what is it that we want to try to implement and use at Equifax. SAS has something built in that they do in their E minor package called... Um, Variable selection? No, auto neural. Hmm. Auto neural, where it somehow picks the best architecture, whatever that happens to be. Okay? But once I have my model constructed and my model is monotonic in each of the inputs, then it's real easy 
to generate the reason codes because we're just going back to that formula I showed you at the very beginning. Okay? For logistic regression, again, we're doing this. How many, how many points could I've gotten minus how many points did I get? Okay? But we're backing up a step. We're training our model now as a black box, and we're assuming that I know the location of the maximums, which I do. I constructed my model in that manner so that I would know where these values are. Okay? And then I'm just changing one dimension at a time. You walk down the mountain one dimension at a time and see how far you fall. We'll rank order these and we'll take the top four. So this is another graph where we went back to our telecommunications example and look at what happens if you hold your portfolio for a risk manager for a telco company, you hold your portfolio bad rate constant 9.5%. The red part, which is about 1.3% more consumers are approved, held at that same risk rate. Again, this is millions of customers for this particular telco provider. So uh, you get a higher approval rate while maintaining a constant risk portfolio. And we captured, we moved more consumers. What happens is this model reorders the people compared to a logistic regression model. And it pushed more people who should be bad farther down into the tails and brought people who should not be bad up from the tails. And that's why this is thicker here. So you see that the logistic regression at the 30% bad capture rate, we got 61.64% of all the bads versus 61%. Doesn't seem like a big number when you're talking millions of people, you're talking some real profit. Uh, what made you decide on the neural network instead of a support vector machine or gradient boost or something like that? Why did you pick that specific technique? Um, convenience yeah. was the main one. We, we typically test um, random forest support vector machines and neural networks, and of late we've also tested gradient boosting to see, to see what's out there. Um, we picked the neural networks because even though people treat it like a black box, it's not. It has some nice, easy, but semi-messy math to work with those. It, the important thing is it's continuous, so I can talk about all these derivatives up here without worrying about it. You know, random forest, for example, is you're discretizing your attributes in, in these, you know. This is only the start to hit on exactly what the industry's plan is, what Equifax's plan is, you know. We want to get to the point where machine learning is routinely a part of risk decisions. And some industries in the world, these, these regulations are not a concern, they're already doing it. So you'll find some academic papers out there about all these various methods in the credit or scoring industry. It's just, it is a challenge here in the U.S. because of the regulation we live under. So I would add that, in part, it was an accident as well. I mean, like I said early on, we had this regional bank customer that said, yeah, we're interested in neural networks, but not unless the regulators sign off on them. And at the time, we had this software package called Angos. And Angos would build a neural net, and it actually had a variable selection feature in there that, uh, that worked really well, stepwise procedure for trying to figure out what was the best candidate. Very well, very three. slow. Yeah, it was slow. Um, but that's what we had. So we had a neural network package, and it also did a few other things like cluster analysis. But the, the best feature of it was it would export the SAS code, so you could actually take that SAS code and then compute this partial derivative, and that's what we started with. And then we moved, when our big Cambrian environment was built, this big Hadoop platform with, you know, all of the data loaded into it and all of this other software attached to it where we had SAS Enterprise Miner, then we already had something built that we could test in Enterprise Miner and its neural network capability. But as Matt said, all of that is coming. To us, this is a method of machine learning and you know we're agnostic. Whatever works best, we'll take it and as long as we can feed that to the industry. But the risk industry is incredibly slow moving. They're even slower than we are, which is hard to believe. And the reason I ask is because with my limited experience, um, 
um, trying to train the hidden layers of the neural network is way too long and the payoff is great compared to some of the other machine learning techniques that are out there. And when you compare the accuracy of the validation sets, you know, it's, it's not always the neural network isn't always the only best. So. Agreed. Um, <coughs> <laughs> we often observe random forests being the best. They suffer from their own industry challenges as well. Um, to get a random forest to significantly outperform, so this is my experience, nothing to cite here. To get a random forest to extensively outperform a neural network, you have to severely overfit your development data to get that performance you're looking for on the validation sample. And when you're talking about your performance going from, I'll talk in terms of KS, from a 30 KS down to a 10 KS, that type of decrease is extremely scary in the industry. When people are used to looking at logistic regression where instead I would build a logistic regression that had an 11 KS on the development sample and a 10 KS on the validation. They're used to those types of decreases, but not going from 30 down to 10. Right, so those, the, the overfitting type thing is also a problem. Not a problem, it is a challenge to get it adopted in the industry. Yeah, because of the risk aversion. I mean, people are going to look at that and they're quite, the first question they're going to have is, is this stable over time? And so we also, you know, for this, we use three uh, modeling data sets. We have the development set, the, the validation set, and the out of time set. And so you would have to, you'd certainly have to demonstrate I mean, the, the difference in those KS curves could be, it's almost square to something that is tracking along with what logistic regression looks like in the validation sample. And people are gonna look at that and that, that's gonna make them extremely leery out there, these risk managers for big banks. It is, it is slow by design because you make a mistake and um, you get hit with hundreds of million dollars worth of fines, so. I'm so, looking up here now, and I, I attended a conference earlier this year called HIMSS. It's the biggest healthcare conference um, in Vegas. And I attended nine sessions on predictive analytics. And I asked everybody there, what kind of regulations are there in healthcare? And there's nothing. Um, it's like the wild, wild west now. People are just trying they to- They better enjoy it before the government know, gets in. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're saying that the gap is gonna come down at some point, but right now, people are just, playing with whatever they want and seeing what works, you know, if, if, it work, if, if it works in reality, like when you're starting to validate month after month and your models are performing well and it's saving lives or it's saving money for the hospital, then that's what these healthcare institutions are implementing. Mm -hmm. That sounds, you know, if you take our industry and you look outside the U.S., the spectrum runs from you know, the U.S., which is extremely closely regulated in terms of risk, to, you can go to India, zero regulations. What, and you're in, if you're in this environment, you don't need what we have built here. This is built to work in this industry, in, in the United States. And you can relax those constraints until you have none, and now you have an unconstrained neural network. And you can still get better predictions. In fact, what we have observed in our tests is if you, that's how we start. Is it worth building this thing at all? You start with an unconstrained neural network. You will get some lift. You compare that to logistic regression. About 50% of the difference between those two extremes is what we can expect out of the models that we're building under this regulatory environment. But as you go to some place like India, where they've had zero, you can use any, uh, literally any variable you want. But I will go. say the uh, conscious customer what we've seen internationally, even if they're not under regulation, but they suspect that they will start to be regulated, you know, they will go ahead and start self-regulating before that regulation gets put in place. That may be something you see in the health industry you're talking about, I don't know. Right. So coming from a think tank in healthcare, there's a lot more regulation on protecting the privacy of individual records, right? That patient privacy protection that's huge and not so much on how it's treated in the modeling aspect. So it's really been up to the individual practitioners and various things. I think with IBM acquiring human analytics, so they're one of the biggest um, technology resources in the healthcare data, you'll probably start to see some more questions about how their data is being treated. Now, the, the, the concern 
and rightfully so, that one has here is if I generated a reason code that said something like a uh, number of delinquencies you've had over the past two years, um, I, that's a bad. Your, your utilization, okay, maybe your credit card utilization right now is at 95%. And your number one reason code comes back and says, you know, here's your score, it's a 600, and the number one reason why it's not an 850 is your credit card utilization. So you really clamp down and work hard for a year, and nothing on your credit file changes except for your utilization. And it goes from 95% down to 10%. For a neural net, we can't guarantee that your score would actually improve. What happens if your score then decreased? You know, and, and that's probably an extreme example I just gave you, but that's what can happen in, in a non-monotonic model. What's going on behind the scenes is that attribute is really interacting with another attribute in there, but we're not really returning reason codes on these interactions, nor are we even detecting these interactions. The neural network's picking up these interactions implicitly. That's a feature of it. You don't have to go out and find them. It discovers them on its own. So is that an issue then, that that hidden layer that really sends you those interactions? It's really the mathematics. It looks like the multiplication of the coefficients. It's really just a linear combination fed into a model, just a log of that. So that it seems like that those interaction terms are really what you're picking up on. Right? You get that additional work. That I wouldn't call it a problem. That's the challenge. Okay. It's also the feature. <laughs> it's uh, why do why do neural networks work? It is it is allowing the nonlinearities, but more importantly, it's allowing the interactions in between the variables. So what you'll see in that, you know, that product where I just look at this path, is this a positive path or is this a negative path? The challenge is that some of those are positive and some of those are negative, and I expected the overall sum to be positive, then the positive paths have to outweigh the negative paths. And that's what, that's what we're doing here. It would be nice if um, we had something like this R package where it just by design built all of them to be positive paths from the start. Yeah, have you looked into the deep learning technology? Where we've got more than one hidden layer? Deep learning, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you can get many, many uh, hidden layers inside. So this, uh, this when, when Matt developed the proof for the single hidden layer model, we did that for a reason. There's at least one paper out there. Sabenko, is that the guy's name? Yeah. I think it was 1999. He, he has no, a proof. Wait before that. Was it? Sabenko. I can't remember. Well, we have the citation. 86. Somewhere. Oh, man. Okay. A single hidden layer network is dense in the space of continuous functions. And so there isn't any reason to have more than one. If you have perfect data. Yeah. Which we don't. If you have perfect data, yeah. then the class of single hidden layer, fully connected V4 neural networks, are dense in the space of continuous functions. So if you have perfect data, you only need one layer. You just need to get your number of nodes correct. Everything we're predicting is continuous. So, having said that, what we did, what Matt did was, he said, we don't want FICO to come in and say we've got a two hidden layer neural network that's superior to this. So he produced the same proof that we see here, but for any number of hidden layers, P. You, you can go as many layers as you want, as yeah. long as it's deep forward. The deep learning is not just a, a have, you have, have more hidden layers. The learning technique is the good change. So the learning technique is, is nothing that affects this problem. All I care is that at the end when it's learned, no matter how it did it, that each of the, the sum of the paths is... So for example, you talk about you have many, many variables. So right now you can only take a very limited number of them. Mm -hmm. But the deep learning technique, basically there's a automatic feature selections involved in the mm -hmm. deep learning techniques. Mm -hmm. so, so basically you can have, let's say, if you really have many, many features, you can have like 100 layers. But the learning technique is totally changed. So like this module derivative back propagation type of thing will not work for deep learning right. because the error diminishes, yeah. you know. So yeah. you can only work for two or three layers, then it's gone. For deep learning, you, they typically use uh, like uh, uh, unsupervised learning to learn the layers, to learn the weights for the for the, all the layers. Then on the top, you have the, you have the multi-layer perception or logistic regression. So basically, that was sort of the problem that you can you can do the kind of feature selection automatically. So basically you can you can extract some high level type of concepts from, from your attributes or from from, from your Are you interpreting the concepts? Right. 
Yeah, yeah. Like, like basically, right now you select the one attribute by one by one, but you can consider that there may be some correlations among a bunch of attributes right. or something like that. You know, uh, but just a suggestion. You may take a look at that. And also, deep learning is driven by big data. You said we have millions of customers with many years of observations. So that are perfect fit into deep learning. So, so just a suggestion. Another suggestion is uh, since you talk about uh, random forest, right? So basically, the random forest works in a way that it's, a, it's an ensemble approach. Mm -hmm. So every time they randomly select the attributes to build the tree, then finally they aggregate the results together. So I think you can do the same thing for the multi-layer perception that you use, right? So every time you, you randomly sample the attributes to build the networks, then finally assemble them together. Yeah. So on, ensemble yeah. is a challenge, and that's, that's another challenge that I mentioned on random forest. We compete on speed just as much as we compete on model performance. Right. We have service level agreements that say you click, I want my credit score, and you got to return it in nanoseconds type thing. If you take a random forest, it's got, um, you know, the one I saw that they were trying to implement had two million lines of code. And they said, fine, I can, I can implement it, but we're not able to meet our service level agreements. That was with 50 trees, that particular. So that's, that's another, another concept coming to the picture, which is a big data platform. And you talk about Hadoop, Hadoop or, Hadoop or Spark. Basically, like when you build a random forest, all these components are independent. They can run in a parallel. Right, they can run a parallel for right. systems. So, so, right. so now, if you have the platform, then you can. Yes, exactly. So our, our Cambrian platform is like our research engine. Yeah, that's the but deal. The, we don't have the, any. The production platform is different. So we build these models in this platform, and they get implemented on the production side. They and that's where they see your job yeah. and implement it on a traditional system. Like, so. like the, the online decision that that is nothing to do with the training, right? So no, training, no. training, the training can take as long as it wants. Yeah, exactly. it's only inconveniencing the statistician. <laughs> it's the it's the implementation, it's the fulfillment and run in real time. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the challenge. So that's just another constraint. Yeah, you can. We can build the world's greatest model, but if we can't put it into production, we got you know there's an issue. So that curiosity then, so all these things are they installed on like a client server that they spec out and purchase, or are they installed in something that's at Equifax that's in ICs? Okay, so there's all sorts of weird constraints. Yeah, we have lots of delivery mechanisms. <laughs> our our main one would be a, a platform that we host, and people just. Uh, you know, query in name, address, birthday, whatever, and then in return you get back the score, reason codes, maybe some attributes, variables that fed the model, something like that. Okay. But a lot of people purchase the credit file in bulk as well, so it's just on their system and they're storing on their system. Any other questions? Well, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Um, please take more pizza because the more pizza you guys eat, the less pizza we'll eat. Um, so make sure you take some on the way out. Um, be on the lookout on the website for the next Big Data Lecture Series um, seminar, which will be coming up probably sometime in the August, September timeframe. Um, so thank you again for coming and we'll see you again.